one way students might be able to get into this is with an electronic kit, just starting out mm. uh, playing a few sounds. And if they don't well, think they can compose, yeah. they could trick themselves into realizing they can. Yeah, I, I, had, I had talked to Don about this the other day. For those of you who either have any kind of electronic kits or access to one, one way you could, you could try in the digital world of getting into that is record a MIDI performance of anything that you like to play and then actually when you when you open it up in the computer you could then assign the MIDI notes to do, it's constrain it to a you know B flat minor scale or something like that so it's it's just looking at certain thing won't play it randomly and see what your performance generates inside that suddenly you might hear something that is triggers off a whole other series of ideas or melodies or or ostinatos and and there's lots of ways that that you can you can take things that you already know how to do and turn them into something else and Marco Miniman gave me a great tip about this because we were talking about the, the writing process and 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 very often for me the last thing it actually is the drums that I think about. I'm, I, I work out a kind of, maybe it's a melody line or a keyboard progression or whatever it is, and then I, drums come on at the end, but he said, you know, sometimes what I do is I will play an open solo, and then I listen to that and I construct a composition around that. And I thought, you know, that mm. that's a great idea because a lot of times when I'm writing, now I know that oddly enough the, the technology has made me a better composer but a worse player because I used to sit and I'd have, if I had a hard left hand part, I'd play that until I could get that with the right hand part. And I'm kind of glad that I went through that, but now I think it's enough for me if I can hear it. If I can hear that, okay, I get the bass line in. If I have to play a lot of the, the, the melody lines on my mallet, uh, which I can use on my drumistic technique. The mallets are the midway point between piano, which is a percussion instrument in the percussion family, and the drums. So I use all of those, but sometimes the, um, the comfort zone of playing something that my hands would normally play is taken away when I'm actually having to play to something where I have I, I play something as a solo that I wouldn't necessarily think of constructing any kind of moving harmonies or melodies around. And that has pushed me into thinking about uh, phrasing in a very, very different way. And that was a great suggestion he made because, because I, I kind of backed into something like that and it made me think outside of what is comfortable to play here. So sometimes maybe I'm just trying to, okay, there's something I did here, I'm gonna try to play a melody. Maybe it's kind of like a, the way Zappa used to have the marimbas and drums and guitar all playing these, these ensemble lines together. Uh, I'm not saying it's exactly like that, but it, it can be, it can come from that sort of thing that isn't really necessarily coming from uh, the way a piano player might uh, construct that. Mm -hmm. So push if you push yourself out of that comfort zone of however you practice, however even if you're practicing, and I would say that applies to drums. If you, I keep a, I used to keep a dictaphone before iPhones and things like that, and I would always be singing all these things into it l for later transcription or what. And I would sing a, a a phrase. I could clearly hear it, and then I'd go, I've got to now figure out how to play that on the drum. So it's sort of, I think of that as reverse engineering into the uh, into the actual performance. I think everybody must have that too. When, you're, when I'm practicing by myself, a lot of times I'm hearing music. You know, it's imaginary sometimes and just something that's sympathetic to the feel and the, the rhythmic structure that I'm messing around with. But I absolutely hear it. And in solos too, I find that when I'm soloing, the phrasing is a big part of what I do because it's based on a musical expression of some, an imaginary counterpart to uh, what I'm playing in the drums. And that's, that's what gives you a song, sympathy in, in a song to what we're talking about yeah. too when you're presented with a piece of music. You want to be sympathetic to it. And yes, you're bringing your spirit to it, but there is, um, there's a moderate level of common musicality. There's a complicated phrase to say a simple thing, but when you hear a, a piece of music, there's something that it wants to say already. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. So you want to go to there and, mm -hmm. and meet it. So uh, a lot of times I find, like I was, just, I was saying, when I started, I'd play along with the radio. So whatever came on the radio, I was playing to. And that gave me a, a, a lot of stylistic variation and such, and also a musical education such that I can sit down now and, and if I'm playing a samba or a Brazilian beat or something, I'm hearing that music with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm just practicing and, and if I do a, a long warm up that will go through 
um, the waltz figures and Latin figures and, and that. Um, yeah, I am hearing music all the way through that. Mm. Just, a, just a sketch of something chordally and melodically that's making it much more than just drums to me. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a bigger mm. part of the composition aspect of it, too. Yeah. And you can compose in your imagination in the way that Don was saying sometimes. And yes, I've, I've done it both ways, of composing a piece to practice, too, but also practicing and hearing a piece that complements what I'm doing and that's makes right. it yeah. feel better. Mm -hmm. And people say, how can you sit down and practice drums for an hour, or how could I sit and play just the hi-hat for an hour or with hi-hat and well, I wasn't just hearing that. That's right. I was yeah, hearing right. a whole other thing mm -hmm. going on, and that's, that's right. why I could improvise on that and phrase in those slow tempos and very legato patterns and figures and, and syncopations. And music is made up, drumming in particular, is made up so many. Syncopation was dis, uh, described as disturbed accents. And I love mm -hmm. that when you've got the linear sense of time and the syncopations, the accents are mm -hmm. punched and pulled this <laughs> way and that. And that's what I would be doing when I was practicing every day with just hi hat, is experimenting with syncopation in perfect time and when I had my long long two bars of silence I try to keep that syncopation going and it would take a musical framework and eventually yeah I would come back out on mm. it. it might take a lot of time but it became triumphant not just from a technical exercise at all it was always a musical thing Phil yeah. Collins had a great um, analogy about that when drum machines started to dominate and as we and as we can thank him for even though the cycle has repeated itself right now going back to the drum machine thing there was a period in the 80s where it was all drum machines and then suddenly in the air tonight came out and everybody said what's that and and they said that's real drum what a concept real drums and and he single-handedly i think really brought real drums and real non-quantized, I mean, I'm sure he was playing the clicks and all that, back into the mainstream of music. But he talked about, he was doing a record, um, I, I don't remember whose it was, but he, it, was a, it was a session date that he was called for. And he, it was a very slow piece of music. And it was an, he brought his, one of those early roll in, it was 808s or whatever they were, into the session and so he programmed this really nice thing to play to that filled up all the 16th and 32nd notes uh, and and so he had this lovely bed to play on top of so what he he had imagined doing all along was that he was going to have this just to be able to play to really keep him locked into that but 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 other than that Chinese water torture kind of click that we've all played with, it's just mm -hmm. relentless, it's just yeah. so unmusical, and it's anything you can do to get away from that yeah. is great. And he said, then what happened is that he, he told them, turn off the drum machine now and listen to the drum part. And there was this big, airy drum part, but it was completely locked with everything. And so when you're playing slow, and that was something that Cobham used to talk about in terms of subdividing, he would sometimes double, quadruple uh, the, the tempo, in, uh, the subdivision in his head. So I often think of that when I'm playing very slow. It's like a tractor wheel going around, and I'm just picking the spokes off the tractor wheel of 16th to 32nd notes, but I'm still hearing that subdivision. And I thought when Phil Collins did that, I thought that's that. Now that was a very creative way of of using the technology and also not feeling intimidated that these damn drum machines are taking my job. They can. There's a lot we've all learned from working with those damn drum yeah, machines. Yeah. Absolutely sure. Absolutely so. Yeah. It's another yeah. tool. Mm. We have hundreds of lessons on Drum Channel and uh, and a lot of great shows to inspire drummers too. But I think you know. The main thing that I'm hearing here, and I think the big lesson for everyone, is, is there's a lot more to playing the drums than playing the drums. Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, you know, the ability to write and compose and the theme that you wanted to bring to our conversation today and, and to show how the musicality that you have is kind of what makes the individuality that you have. Uh, a better listener, too. Uh, all of yeah. those tools that we talked yeah. about make you a better listener, yeah. and of course that makes you far and away a better musician and a better accompanist for what somebody else is trying to yeah. accomplish. Mm. Yeah. You've always heard, be a, be a good listener, right? You've always heard the, uh, the importance to listen. Mm. You know, I, I heard that all the time when I was a kid, you know, you just listen, you know, you got to listen. And later on when you realize what that means, it's, it's a fantastic thing to, to realize. Then at one at some point you can hear other people listening to you when you're playing. That's a real nice thing. Even mm. guitar players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once in a while. 
<laughs> Hard to believe. That, you know? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, a, that's important. Can, can I ask somebody, can I ask a question here of, of this group of people? Sure. Who here plays another instrument other than drums? Raise your hand. Yeah, good. Good. And who plays piano? Oh, man. That's it. Who plays guitar? Mm-hmm. Well, to me, I've got, I got to tell you, man, the, the, my, one of my main regrets in life is that I didn't stay with the piano when I started, when I could have stayed with it. I was so young that I wasn't married yet. I got married very young. Well, after I got married, piano went. I was playing drums, you know, for $15 a gig, $20 a gig, and supporting a family. So I, I just, I regret that, that I didn't, uh, I could have stayed with it somehow. But man, stay with the piano. Mm. Stay with it. Stay with the guitar. Pick up, the, who, whoever doesn't mess with the other instruments, pick up any, any instrument. And really, because what will happen is you'll, you'll, melody will, will start happening. You'll play a chord and there will be an automatic melody. Just like when they're talking about playing drums, you know, you, I play, I don't play a drum set like Neil's. But my little three or four piece, whatever it is, drum set, that sings a melody every time I play. It's just, it's just like Bill Bruford said, man. It's like these little chords that happen mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're hitting the cymbal and the mm -hmm. snare drum together or a cross stick or whatever it is. Melody is, is, is everywhere. And it's in your head. And, uh, and, and this thing here, I've got an app um, that I bought a while ago for chords for guitar. And every time I turn the phone on, it's like, okay, update. So I, I hit the update, and this latest update that I just hit, it was amazing. I'm actually playing chords. I'm actually hitting chords with my own rhythm, and these exotic chords, nice chords. Mm -hmm. And that is so inspiring, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I can't wait to get, to, my, uh, to, to get back into my room, you know, where I can. Because yeah. th that's, that's what I do. I, I, I find my little composition somewhere I'll make it up make it happen and then I put my drums on it and that's that's beautiful to me that's my favorite thing is when I play drums to my song mm -hmm. and that just helps the whole thing when I'm playing on records later that's you know so do you hear the drum part as you're composing it but you think it should be or do you kind of yeah go I, in as I always hear the drum part but I, I don't I like don't say I don't put the drums on until later that's the last thing I do is put the drums on don't There's so many the, other things to, to go on. You do know, you hear the drum part as you're composing? Um, well, to echo what Jim said, a lot of times I, I don't think too much about the drum part until I get to, I know I'm going to put drums on, then I have to see what I've got there and see yeah. what fits. Um, once in a while it's come from a groove, but not as much. But Marco's suggestion about, I was telling you about using the solo, that, that, that has triggered a whole different way of writing. But uh, I don't think there's any one way. We all have different ways we write, and there's, there's no right or wrong way, and no music school should be telling you that, or a music teacher. It's com it, it is a completely open ball game. Mm. Yeah. Maybe you know some of you will, be, uh, uh, will have the good fortune to be like Neil and to be a, a words guy. <laughs> that's that's just the greatest, man. Mm -hmm. Do you think of the drum parts as you're writing lyrics? Well, again, as I was saying, the analog is so clear to me that a line of, of lyrics is, is so rhythmic and is um, so much about the phrasing that is largely the way I think about drumming and soloing is absolutely is phrase over phrase mm. and how that's built into our music from the wind instrument days and a guitar player's phrase the way sax players phrased because the sax player had to take a breath and that became a part of the phrasing that listeners grew to expect. So guitar mm -hmm. players had to phrase with those little pauses in mm -hmm. there too, as if they were breathing. And I, I conceive of drum rhythms very much like punctuation too. Mm -hmm. um, commas and semicolons in a sentence are made for a verbal punctuation. And I absolutely think of drum parts that way. And, and even on the larger scale of building tension, you do that with words too. There are so many um, analogs between the two. But I absolutely do use the same part of my mind, I think, to think about rhythm, uh, whether it's in words or in drum beats. Well, a lot of times, if you take, uh, take lyrics that you've uh, written, they can stand alone because they have a rhythmic quality to them that I think probably comes from the fact that, that, that you are a drummer. But there, there's the lyrical quality that is married to this, this uh, you know, highly rhythmic 
uh, the way drummers subdivide, we have a way, have a way of, uh, even in, in the most, uh, the complex word or, or, or uh, uh, a phrase that might, that might go over the bar, you can probably hear that in very, in very rhythmic terms. I don't know if you do, but I think that, that, that that's words, clearly too, illustrated in the before, right? Melody being everywhere. Words are melodious, you know, by their nature. Languages, all different languages have a different music yeah, to them, as, well. as cultures have yeah. different um, right. musics, right? Yeah. Different char characteristics to them. Yeah. So again, yeah, the analog is clear there. Words, to me, have a melody. Mm -hmm. And there's that kind of um, uh, synesthesia, where you, mm. when you uh, hear a sound you think of a color. That's mm -hmm. the simple example of it. And there are severe cases of it where, um, uh, where people are seeing everything in, in all their senses are all mixed up. But I absolutely have that in music. Of course, hearing a song, you hear it in colors. Mm -hmm. And uh, with words, too, I have that synesthesia where I hear them as notes and I hear them as melodies and I hear them as rhythms. So that, to me, they're all of a, of a piece, really, the, and mm -hmm. the way that I conceive them, the way I respond to them. And uh, the melody within the words and the rhythm within the words it gives me the same pleasure that mm -hmm. the rhythm in, in drums does, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, after all, um, when you've been playing an instrument as long as all of us have, you must love the nature of that instrument, the sonic and physical response of it, and all of these other um, things, in every case, I think, are subservient to us as drummers, mm -hmm. really. I don't know, do you think of yourself as a drummer first? Yeah, I think I, yeah, because I just, that's the way I started, and... Uh, but like I said, I, I always heard melody in, in yeah. gravy. The first thing I ever did when I got my first set of drums uh, at the age of 13, um, I played a little song called uh, uh, Somebody Bad Stole the Wedding Bell. And I don't, I don't know, I think it was a song at the time uh, on the radio or something. But I would play and instinctively sing that song. I mean, I wouldn't just sit down and play the drums, I would be singing that song. And if somebody would come in the room, I'd stop singing. I'd just play. <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but that was, uh, you know, that was, uh, it was just a natural thing to do. And, and that, this is one other thing, too. What about singing drummers? Mm. What, a, what a great thing, what a great thing to be able to do. Uh, Levon Helm, you familiar oh, with the band? God, yeah. you know, and, and how he, how he, if he had been just playing it, and, and somebody else was singing, which obviously uh, on a lot of those songs it was like that uh, it would have been great but how much greater was it when he would sing uh, mm -hmm. those songs with the phrasing that he did and and just be able to to uh, to back himself like that and mm -hmm. and just hit one tom tom one time mm -hmm. instead where most of us that know the language would mm -hmm. would have played some kind of little mm -hmm. fill that would have pleased us just bam you know and it, but it seemed to me always like I always had to to explain that self to myself, uh, that that okay, the reason why that is so cool is because he has control of it because he's singing, mm -hmm. and so I always just was fascinated with the fact that if if you could sing and play the drums together, I've never seen really a drummer who who sings and plays the drums at the, at the same time who doesn't play great drum parts. It's all it always works really great, whatever band if you can. Think of, you know. Well, his parts were so married together, and, and like you were saying, when he would, because he's singing something on top, and if actually, if you analyze what, like up on Cripple Creek, what he plays, whenever there's a break in the in the in the vocal line, he will there will be a little embellishment, but yeah. it it always makes sense because he never crosses over and steps on the vocal because he's right, because he, he is, is the vocalist. Yeah, he is the vocalist. So it's so wonderful a, when you can put you, and I'm sure you've yeah. had to do that, put yeah. yourself in that framework, well, like. Right, they're like uh, like you, you know, you got to you write the words, yeah, and so you have advantage. that advantage. But you still got to be careful not to step on the vocal. Oh yeah, but that's the advantage of knowing what the lyrics are. So yeah. the, what you were saying about singing the song, I love that when I'm learning the song, I know that part of it too. And right. It's a big part of it. And yeah, I have a big. Um, sympathy for singing. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't have the ability to carry a tune, but I have a good imagination vocally and yeah. very much admire um, vocals and the big band singers and the drummers right behind them and their relation to rhythm. Yeah. And when you, when you hear Sammy Davis Jr. sing or when you hear Frank Sinatra sing, mm -hmm. their rhythmic sensibility and yeah. their phrasing. So uh, yeah, that, that's part of my relation to the music too, but I do love the fact that when I'm learning, when I'm learning a song, the lyrics are already written. I know where they are. I know where the vocals are going to fall. Because again, I love the Keith Moon approach of framing those mm -hmm. vocals. If there's yeah. an opportunity to punch up the rhythm of them, that's, right. that's the thing. Again, you learn from composing from yeah. all different ways too. If you're just laying down a keyboard bad, 
pad and playing to it, you're going to learn what kind of a rhythm is sympathetic to that mood, mm -hmm. right? There's so much more in the nuance of, of music, too, of, of having those rhythmic tools, of being able to respond to the mood of a piece and say, okay, this feels to me like, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and fill that in. That's, that's the decision making. But it's also the interpretation that only a broad am amount of experience to different kinds of music, different styles of music, different cultures of music can bring that in, too. Mm -hmm. When you travel a lot or even just travel musically, you know, the armchair traveler in that sense of absorbing those kind of things. I found so much richness from the music of other cultures and just recently from the, the music of Brazil and being down there and traveling and hearing the music that people are listening to mm -hmm. and traveling through small towns in Brazil and I'd hear this music, what is this? I never, it was a, a beautiful marriage of uh, Portuguese and African music that just grew organically in Brazil that wouldn't make it to us or maybe it in 10 or 20 years it will mm -hmm. in the way that um, Brazilian popular music did in the 60s and then again a bit in the 80s and all that but there's this music percolating around and you don't have to go to all the trouble of motorcycling through Brazil to hear this music it is out there somewhere yeah. if uh, being shared by word of mouth a lot of times mm. batucada you, you hear a bunch of that the batucada um, that was sure. that's that's what always fascinated me that was the kind of the marching oh, thing of the, when yeah. they would when they would gather and, and march and and, and the, the, I don't know if it was a myth or not, but I would always hear, I, 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 they would say that the, uh, a guy with a big bass drum would be on this little mountain right here, and the guy, another guy would be on a bass drum up there, and then down here on the road they'd be doing all the little, uh, uh, the little hand drums and mm. things and the bells and stuff. <laughs> and these two guys up there would start it with boom. They'd start here like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and they'd be doing the thing down here. Wow. And, you know, when you hear that, like, like Nunsuch, I think, was the first time I ever heard that, that label. Mm -hmm. First time I ever heard it. They call it Batucada, and every, every Brazilian I've ever met, I always ask them about that. And they go, oh, yeah, 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 the Batucada. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that, that is, uh, that's an amazing thing. That, that, it, what you said about other music, you know, what, what you do is, uh, you, you don't necessarily learn uh, things. At least I've always felt like I, I haven't learned as much as I've absorbed stuff. Oh, yeah. And it just comes in and it's like there and it'll come out and you don't even know when it's going to come out or, or what. But that Brazilian flavor thing, that, that, that too, you know, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, Cuba 6 or Africa 12, you know, that, that mm -hmm. thing of two, man, where it's just fleetingly, mm -hmm. it's just going by now and now and now and now. Mm -hmm. That just kills me, you know, and that when that gets when that absorbs into you and you're playing, you know that that will come out. That you'll you'll make that happen. Like that'll be. That'll I had a remarkable like experience a few weeks ago. I saw uh, Jack DeJohnette playing with Stanley Clark oh, and yeah. Korea, yeah. and I was with a drummer friend watching it. And of course, it was sublime, masterly playing from three masters with uh, perfect sure. conversation, perfect congruence together. And later, <coughs> we, uh, as we were driving home. My friend and I were talking about the rhythmic hangover or that lingered with us, and it was a Brazilian kind of feel, shishado, that they had not played all night, but they implied that they pulse it, yeah. in their music yeah, so yeah. skillfully, improvising three of them together yeah. with such an understanding mm -hmm. and such a deep musical sophistication that they implied a rhythm that we came away singing. Wow. You know, you know uh, both, of the, both those examples are good illustrations of, of when people say, how do you develop a sonic identity? And I don't think there's any way to, I think, if you really think about it in terms of, I'm going to develop a sonic identity, I'm going to tune my drum, I don't think that that really works. I think that somehow, it's like you were talking about, you assimilate music in a way that is uniquely your own. And we're all of uh, a compendium of the, of, of the, the sum of all our musical experiences, it comes out in each of us in a different way. In the phrasing, in just the, you know, the overall musical sensibility, in whatever proportions those exist in us. And I think that's when you allow that to happen, when you take anything in, you like, if you like, you're saying, you know, it's, it's silly to hate any music. You can, you might be partial to, to some more than others, but I've found that if I'm open, I can learn something from almost everything. Sure. And somewhere in there, there might be a part of it. I mean, maybe I'm not the world's 
best reggae drummer, but if I, re I really like reggae, and, and, and if I connect to it emotionally, then I usually find there's something I can say in that. And, and, and I, I think that's really what makes it authentic, that people say, well, you know, you're an authentic second line player or jazz player or a funk player. You know what? I don't think that uh, you create, you're the one that uh, eventually, if you are playing that with a sense of commitment, I think that you are the one that, that creates the authentic style and, and this idea that you follow. The carrot's always out here, and if you get to that carrot, you're going to be an innovator. I don't think that that, I, I have to say that I see a lot of musicians who mistakenly look at that as the goal and not somehow the assimilation of all this different music that somehow filters through us, comes out, and that is the sum of what we are. Does it give you? I'll buy do, you that. do you understand? I'll buy that for a dollar. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think we all bought that, don't? And uh, uh, yeah, we could hang with you uh, forever. Uh, I mean, this is a great experience. You talk about, you know, the opportunity for uh, students uh, around the world actually to be able to see and 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 hear what you have to say. Uh, let me see hands. How many of you after this uh, would go home and approach the drum set maybe a little bit differently than you did before this? <laughs> Well, <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> That's what Drum Channel is all about. Uh, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us this evening. It's been a, a stellar round table. Let's hear it for uh, Leo and Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, closing thoughts to uh, the students out there in uh, in America? Don, do you have? Oh a, dear, a this is well. You just told us we got to wind this up. Um, <laughs> yes, right. Yes. Um, Ten words. We 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 touched on an awful lot around not just writing, but just around music in general. And and I guess if there's any summation of of any of it, it would be just be open to all of it. Take yeah. it all in. Be a sponge. That's right. A sponge is good. Jim? Yeah, I, I couldn't have said that better. Just open yourself up, you know. Uh, allow things to happen to you. Don't be like the guy that says, ah, I know what's going to happen. If I try, if I do that, this is going to happen. Or if I think that, this is, uh, don't do that. Don't limit yourself in any kind of way. Just be completely open, especially musically. I mean, you know, just let everything happen to you. And then that's how you're going to develop who you are. And also, very key, and I've said this before many times, there's nobody like you in the world. There's nobody like you individually in the world. Nobody can do what you do the way you do it but you. And that's just a fact. That's a, that's a biochemical fact. Isn't that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You can't so, know, you know too much. That's right. You can't feel too much. Yeah. And you probably can't practice too much. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Just very say good. It. Very good. Very good. That very is a great good. way to wind it up. Thank you for joining us tonight on Drum Channel. Thank you for joining us, uh, students of the Drummer's Reality Camp. And we'll see you again real soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.